You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 72 of the Common Sin Podcast. Welcome back. Today's episode, we're going back to the water, and we are going to talk about some of the most iconic of ancient sea predators, the plesiosaurs. Ooh, last episode, we talked about a place that plesiosaurs lived. Yes, we did. Now, let's zoom on in. Yeah, so we're going to discuss this ancient group of marine reptiles. It's extremely diverse, so we're going to go over some of the examples, talk about what features made this group unique, what features made them super weird, and what we do and don't know about them. But, Will, what's a plesiosaur? So, plesiosaurs are those paddle-finned marine reptiles that you always see drawn in dinosaur books whenever they're talking about what's going on in the ocean. Usually you'll see the versions with the long snaky necks. Exactly, but that does not represent all plesiosaurs. No. But the paddle flippers do. Yes. So those big rowboat paddle arms and legs that you see, that's a plesiosaur thing. If you've heard of any plesiosaurs, on the long neck side, you've probably heard of Elasmosaurus. Yep. And on the short neck side, you've probably remember Liopleurodon. Yes. Hopefully from Walking with Dinosaurs. And not from Charlie the Unicorn. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this episode was requested by our listeners, Taylin, one of our patrons. Cool. And Jonathan. Thanks. So thanks. We're excited to talk about this. So we're going to dive into these with these. <laughs> but first, some announcements. Announcements. As always, we still have a Patreon. Still going. Yep. Going it's strong. still there. We checked yesterday. And if you become a patron at a certain level, we like to shout your name out here on the podcast. So I have two of those names. So welcome, Barbara and Toad. Hello, Barbara and Toad. Welcome to the Patreon. I assume that Toad will walk around our castle and keep everything tidy. <laughs> keep the stars safe. <laughs> See, my brain went X-Men. And that I works too. <laughs> Don't you people ever die. That's the only version yeah. of Toe. That's the first version of Toe that comes to mind. <laughs> Welcome to the Brotherhood. <laughs> Our other announcement for this episode is we are in October, so... If you haven't listened to our spooky episodes Ooh. that are out, go give a listen to them. We're doing it again. This time, Greek Monsters. By the time this episode airs, airs comes out and is available <laughs> for download, we will have... Once this broadcast. <laughs> exactly. We will have released three of this month's four episodes. Yes. The first on Harpies. Mm -hmm. The second on Gorgons. Yep. And the third, and this feels like a spoiler because we haven't actually released it as of this recording, but it's it weird. will be out by the time this is out. Hydras. Yes. And then there's one left. Yeah. So yeah. give it a listen. Let us know what you think. Share your thoughts about our thoughts on monsters. <laughs> And that's going to wrap up our announcements, I think. I don't I think, think we have much it. else to say. Chill time of the year. So let's just take a, a nice, easy pace and go into our news section. Every episode, we like to dip our fingers into what's going on in the scientific community and take a look at some of the more recent pieces of news and paleo and evolution and all those good categories. So, David, what do you got for us? Well, in the world of paleo news, a thing that we, I think, have somehow managed to not mention at all in our podcasting thus far, is that SVP just happened. Oh, that thing. Yeah, so you remember two years ago we did an episode around this time of the year about mm -hmm. the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting every year. There's a big meeting. That time I went and we reported on it because it was in Calgary. This year it's in. it was in Brisbane. Which is awesome. So we didn't go. Yeah. But it does mean that there's all sorts of cool news coming out from all the research being presented at SVP. And one of them has really been making the rounds for two reasons. Number one, it's surprising. Number two, it's about dinosaurs. Oh! Specifically, the biggest dinosaurs, the sauropods, long necks, long tails, big column feet. And if this research is to be believed, beaks. Ooh. So if you've been following the paleo internet sphere, you'll see that there's been a lot of paleontologists talking about this idea of sauropods with beaks. Now... 
Lots of other dinosaur groups had beaks. We know that Ceratopsians had beaks, Pachycephalosaurs had beaks, Stegosaurs had beaks. But it's not really ever been seriously considered, I don't think, that sauropods were beaked. This is research that was presented, not published yet, but presented at SVP, by Kaylee Wiersma et al., and we'll link to a link by an article in Science Magazine by John Pickrell. So here's the thing about sauropods, right? At the end of those long necks are these tiny heads, and inside the tiny heads are lots of teeth. Uh, usually, you know, small, you know, famously like peg-like teeth. Yeah. Just gathering up as much food as they can, shoving it into their gullet. Well, the teeth are commonly found in isolated rows. So you're digging for fossils, and instead of finding a whole skull with teeth in it, a lot of times you'll just find the teeth, but not individual teeth. Right? That's really familiar for paleontologists. Like, oh yeah, a theropod, a, a T-Rex tooth by itself. Sauropods, you will often find the whole row by itself, but still in position. No jawbone around it, just the teeth. So these researchers argue that something was probably holding the teeth in place that stayed around long enough while the flesh and stuff disappeared and the, 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 the skull kind of broke apart. Something was holding the teeth in place and stopping them from becoming dispersed. In this study, they looked at seven sets of teeth from a variety of different sauropods, and they looked at the skulls, so analysis of the skulls of a couple of famous ones, Camarasaurus and Europasaurus, for those keeping count. And what they found is in the isolated teeth, they saw that there is wear on the teeth, right? Wear from just being in the elements up against uh, food and stuff, only about 50% of the way down the tooth. Ooh. Which suggests that something was covering the teeth. Another thing they noticed is that in the jaw bones of the skulls they looked at, they found tiny pits in the surface of the jawbone, which is a feature that is sometimes linked to blood vessels that are feeding and nourishing extra tissue around the jaw. Mm -hmm. Now, the official term for a beak is, in this case, a ramphotheca, usually a keratinized sheath that covers, you know, part of the mouth. In this case, they say if there was a beak you could have had these teeth sort of loosely attached to the skull, which they appear to have been, but not totally exposed. So currently when we sort of picture how we reconstruct sauropods, we have them with these teeth sort of loosely sticking away from the jaw. They're saying, no, there was probably a keratinized sheath of tissue there protecting the teeth, which is important. You need your teeth to be covered in things to protect them from the elements and also holding them in place. Interesting. It's an odd thing to try and look into because there are no modern animals that serve as a really good comparison for it. Yeah, that's what I was just... I, I've been trying to picture it as you're describing it, and it's, it's very alien. Because there's no living animals that have teeth in their beaks. Yeah. Turtles have beaks. Birds have beaks. So having teeth in your beak is kind of a weird thing. But we know other dinosaurs did it. Triceratops did it, and, and Stegosaurus did it. So, yeah. Artists, like our friend Gabriel, who actually did post a, an image of his take on the sauropod beak thing, uh, episode 64, check out Gabriel, ha may have to reconsider how they draw sauropods. That's very interesting. I mean, like you said, it, it's not unusual. Herbivorous dinosaurs seem to widely use that clipping beak to nip at plants. So, I mean, it, it it always actually confused me when I was younger, and they would just show these rake-like teeth. Now, and it doesn't have to be a, like, turtle beak. Yeah. It can just be, you know, reinforced keratinized tissue that kind of comes around the mouth. It doesn't have to look like a, you know, an eagle. Exactly. It can just be an, ex an extra little hard covering there. Very cool. I've also seen it pointed out in, well, I think, the article that we'll link to, that beak-like tissue, beak-like structures around the mouth, are obviously we have them in birds. A bunch of different dinosaurs have them. And also there are some ancient croc cousins that have them. Yeah. So it may not actually be that surprising that sauropods have them. It appears to have been a widespread feature in archosaurs in general. Beaks. Beaks. 
So speaking of ancient croc cousins, my next bit of news is about the potential diets of a lot of these ancient, especially the weirder shaped croc cousins by looking at the shape of the skull and snout and taking a look at how that compares to today's crocs. Uh, this is not the first time people have looked at snout shape to try to look for trends, but this one did a very encompassing look and took a, a survey of diets as well to compare. Ooh. So very in-depth study as to how croc faces match what they eat. So this is research by Stephanie Drumheller and Eric Wilberg. Ooh, we're going to see Stephanie this weekend. In the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. And the article we're linking to is from University of Tennessee Knoxville News. And it linked to their editors at the bottom, Karen Dunlap and Amanda Womack. Crocs today are relatively similar shaped for the most part. I mean, you definitely have thinner snouts and wider snouts, but they're all fairly low to the ground aquatic predators with a long face. Uh, but ancient crocodilians and crocodilomorphs, their cousins, had a wide variety of shapes and forms from completely marine to fully terrestrial and all sorts of different shapes in their face that we don't see today as well. So the researchers wanted to get an idea of what these ancient crocs might have been eating by doing a very extensive study of today's crocodilians. They used mathematical analysis to map the shapes of the skulls. They surveyed modern croc diets, so they were actually directly matching diet to skull. They used a modeling method to reconstruct the diets for fossil groups, and they even used forensics on damaged bones with croc bite marks from the mm -hmm. fossil record to add to that diet information. That's cool. So they came at this from a lot of different angles. The first point they make is that we used to put crocs into two major bins, the slender snout and the broad snout, the longirostrine and the platyrostrine. And slender snouts ate fish, broad snouts ate whatever. Yeah. Tough stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever they wanted, really. And the truth is blatantly more complicated than that. We've known this for a while, but their study supported this, that... The classic examples of the slender snout today, like the slender snout croc, uh, which is now more than one species in Africa, <laughs> and the Indian gharial, which has the most slender of the snouts, do not just eat fish. They actually eat a wide variety of small things, still usually small for their size, but they are not pure fish eaters. They're eating pretty much what they can catch. They're just aiming for a smaller size on things. But it doesn't guarantee that they're piscivorous if you have something with a skinny face. And with the broader snouts, the things that eat larger prey, they actually found that there's a split there. And this was interesting. This is something that I had not seen particularly mentioned this way in other studies. Is they found that there are V-shaped and U-shaped snouts. Okay. Which is how you usually split crocodiles and alligators, but that their diets fall into two different categories with those different shapes. So today, gators are U-shaped and crocs are V-shaped. Is that something that has varied in their history? It has, but also there are crocs that are pretty much U-shaped. Like, right, right, right. You know, the Nile crocodile by no means has a skinny face. Of, <laughs> it's not a V-shaped face. That is a very, that would be a very broad V. Right, you know, right. it is still robust. Uh, same with things like the saltwater crocodile. But the American crocodile, that's here in Florida, in North America, and in the Caribbean and South America, has the traditional, very pizza slice shaped snout. Interesting. So that's kind of the archetype, while the American alligator is the go-to for the U-shaped snout. Right. Almost as if the people that made up the rules for how to tell crocs and gators apart lived here in North America. Yeah, where the only place they overlap is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What they found is that the V-shaped snouts correspond with animals that are able to eat prey up to their own size, while U-shaped are often able to take things bigger than their size category. Oh. Like Nile crocodiles taking down wildebeests. Wildebeests. And, big, and it's not saying that they are always going for things bigger than them, but that they can take down things that would be outside their size that you would expect. 
And so there's actually a distinction even in the broads, you know, the quote unquote broad snouted crocodilians. This seemed to pan out with many of the similar shaped fossil species, but there were a few groups who fall out of these categories completely. Notably, the ocean going marine crocs. These had slender snouts like gharials and other traditionally thought fish eaters, but the back of the head is wider and where the muscles are focused and the eyes are not on top, but more on the sides of the skull, which suggests it's not ambushing and that it's hunting in a different way. So it's still using a thin snout underwater to catch either fish or other things like that, but it's not sneaking up on them at the surface, so it doesn't need its eyes on top. Right, you're actually hunting underwater. Yes. Oh, that's cool. As for many of the species that lived on land, you see a very different skull shape. Uh, the teeth are very different, notably with these. Uh, they have the ziphodont teeth, those flattened steak knife teeth that are even serrated at times. Yeah, like Komodo a dragon style. Yes. Also very comparable since they overlapped with carnivorous dinosaurs. Yes. Those teeth have actually been confused for one another in the past many a time because of how similar they can look. Their eyes are also more positioned on the side of the head. So it's suggesting that both the marine and the land predatory crocs are more active than ambush. And the land-based crocs from other studies, I've also seen reference that they often have more compressed faces side to side, not top to bottom. Oh, which is interesting because in early amphibians, and indeed modern amphibians, you see that top to bottom flattening mm -hmm. but in carnivorous dinosaurs you see the side to side yeah flattening. if you're binding things on land you don't need to hide in the shallow water so yeah. put all that force <laughs> one way <laughs> the bite marks lined up with a lot of these findings there are a few that didn't which they said could also be attributed to scavenging so they may not be showing attacking or hunting traces but later on feeding traces especially for the size categories uh, that was where they noted the scavenging was probably the the best answer for crocodilian bite marks on things way outside their size category is them scavenging on the skeleton of a giant sauropod or a giant, you know, proboscidean. Uh, but most of the bites match to the size classes that they were expecting for the shapes of those skulls. Cool. There were some that fell out of this study because there are no bite marks for these groups. And those are the stubby-faced terrestrial crocs and the surfboard-faced crocs. <laughs> so the stubby-faced crocs are like Simosuchus, which have these flat little faces, and from what their teeth look like, probably were herbivorous. They don't have sharp teeth. So there are no chew marks on bones from them, because they probably weren't biting anything right we didn't find bite marks on plants exactly which means we can't use this same study technique on them to match their skull to feeding categories right for hunting and exactly so we can't correlate it the same way we've been doing the others the other group we do think were predatory the surfboard faced crocs these were the there's a couple of them that had these just wide flat long mouths like a pelican itty bitty teeth around it and they think that actually, like a pelican, they may have had a pouch ah. under the jaw, which modern crocodilians use to carry babies. But there's no bite marks from them because they very likely were feeding in a different way. Right. So they may not have been biting onto their things as much as scooping them up right. or some other strange feeding. So we don't get any hints from them using this study method. So those two are weird enough they did not fit into this analysis it's always fun when you can find those morphological patterns so you can look at the shape of a skull and go, oh, I already know a bunch of stuff about this creature just from the way its skull is shaped. That's one of my favorite things to show people is how we can decipher, uh, decipher skulls by just looking at where are the eyes placed, where are the nostrils placed, how big are different things, and that can tell you a lot about how an animal lived without needing to even know what it is. What's really exciting to me about being able to study croc feeding by their facial structure is how much other animals have taken on that croc niche, 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 like early amphibians mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, early whales. So that facial structure could potentially even be expanded out to 
other groups of animals. I'll be interested to see if anyone gets to try that. Yeah, that'd be cool. Neat. Well, my next bit of news is about mammoths. Hey, cool. Very small mammoths. Very recent mammoths. Very dead mammoths. So... As most mammoths are. (laughs) This is newly published research about the disappearance of the very last mammoths on Earth. Research by Laura Arp, or RP, et al., in Quaternary Science Review, and we'll link to an article by George Dvorsky in Gizmodo. In episode 66, we talked about elephants. And Will brought up, if I remember correctly, the Wrangell Island Mammoths. I did. Yeah, so at the end of the Ice Age, episode 25, all the mammoths disappeared. Except for some. Most notably, there are a couple of islands on which mammoths persisted for Thousands of years beyond the extinction of all the other giant mammoths. The most famous of these are the mammoths of Wrangell Island off of northeastern Siberia. And they're famous, one, because they were small. Dwarf. Island dwarfism, episode four. And famous because they are, based on dating of their remains, known to have survived until 4,000 years ago. That's ridiculous. Which means there were already the pyramids of Giza when these mammoths finally went extinct on this island. But dating also seems to suggest that you had mammoths, you had them, you had them, you had them, and then they were gone. That they relatively abruptly went extinct. And so many authors have wondered what the deal was. The classic idea of extinction is, you know, habitat slowly declines, the animals get slowly less fit for the environment as the habitat changes, or less able to survive as the habitat deteriorates, and then they disappear. But here, it was real quick. So in this study, they sought to find out what exactly was going on. So they took a lot of isotope data, so elemental studies of the chemical composition of teeth, and bone, in this case, 77 different mammoths from Wrangell and Siberia, and comparing with mammoths from lots of other places, island versus mainland, older versus younger, to see what kind of differences they could notice. Cool. One of the most significant things that they picked up was that the isotopes they were finding included lots of sulfur and strontium, which suggests that they were picking up these elements in levels that you don't normally want to see because they can be toxic, which they suggest may have been from the weathering of the rocks on the island that they lived on, that because this is a time of rising sea level, you have more water making it onto the island, you have more precipitation as the climate gets warmer coming out of the Ice Age, you may have had more weathering, and those toxic sort of metal metallic elements and other toxic elements are more abundantly either weathering out of the rock or being washed onto shore from ocean water getting into the soil getting into the water okay so it looks like the island had contaminated drinking water yeah but this wouldn't have killed the mammoths but it may have made them a little bit more vulnerable Mm -hmm. they also found corroboration with recent genetic work on these mammoths that found that on the island, they had unusually low genetic diversity. That normally in a big population, you see a lot of variation in the genes. Here, you didn't see that. In fact, there are a lot of genetic chunks that are missing from these island mammoths that you don't see missing in other mammoths. A lot of anomalies. Notably, uh, some of those missing genes, so that the lost genes, are related to fat metabolism. Hmm. And the authors point out that the island was milder than the mainland of Siberia, so maybe they weren't relying on fat reserves quite as much as, you know, if you're living up in the the cold tundra and stuff. Again, low genetic variation, missing some genes from their ancestors, not the kind of thing that would absolutely, you know, that's not going to kill them, they were doing okay. But it makes them weaker. It makes them less able to adapt to change. So these things together display the interesting result that, as they put it, Wrangell Island 
was able to maintain typical mammoth ecology despite changing climate, changing genetic diversity, compared with there is another island, St. Paul Island, that was also a mammoth refugium almost as long, where they apparently were more susceptible to the changing environment and they weren't surviving as well. All of this makes them suspect that the extinction may actually have come down to one or a few significant events. That you had mammoths on the edge, right, on the brink, already weakened, low genetic diversity, chemical weirdness going on with their environment, and you could have had one bad year mm -hmm. that just devastated the population. Interesting. That's It's always almost more foreboding to me when the answer to an event like that isn't, well, these new animals showed up. Yeah, you because know, sometimes you get that where it's like, we had this animal and we didn't. And then at that time we didn't, we started seeing this animal and they moved in and killed the old animal. Right. That happens sometimes, very cut and dry, invasive species. And indeed, the the, the go-to animal for animals, for, for creatures like this is humans. Yes. But the authors point out that the earliest evidence for humans on the island is several hundred years after the mammoths go extinct. It's like that's a, it's almost creepier when it's just like no they just they the dice did not go their way yeah just one thing after another until they just weren't anymore ooh that's so that's so much more insidious of just like they they did nothing wrong and things just didn't pan out <laughs> <laughs> well they gave an example of an extreme event that they think could be the kind of thing that would do it ooh what's called a rain on snow event. So apparently this is a thing that can happen, particularly when you have, you know, mixed rain and snow, which is something you might see in a environment of changing climate as things get warmer, where you get snow, you know, snow cover and then rain freezes it into just a frozen coating over the grass and stuff. And it blocks grazers from getting access to the plants. This is not hypothetical. They cite an example that happened in Canada, on Banks Island, Canada, in 2003, where 20,000 musk oxen died wow. because a rain-on-snow event happened and they couldn't eat grass. Yeah, 20,000 on an island. That'll do it. That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Now, granted, that, that that happened is hypothetical. Yes. But an event like that in an already diminished, sort of weakened, not very adaptable because low genetic diversity population, yeah, that something like that could easily start a rapid cascade into extinction. It's kind of crazy to think that just things raining at the wrong time. And then, and just like that, mammoths were gone. Poor little mammoths. Well, my next bit of news is also about things that are tiny and cute. Like tiny mammoths? But even smaller. Like tiny rhinos. Like even smaller than that. Go on. We're talking tardigrade sized. Oh. Yeah. Water bears. Water bears. Famously featured in Ant Man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Their big screen debut. Yeah. <laughs> but we're not talking about tardigrades. Uh, well, you lied to me. But almost. Okay. But not really. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm hooked. <laughs> So this is a study that is describing hundreds of preserved itty-bitty invertebrates that are real similar to tardigrades, but not tardigrades frozen in amber. So for anyone who is unfamiliar, tardigrades are these very small, like micrometer, yes. you know, measured in micrometers, and they're kind of these pudgy... They're little invertebrates. They've got four, or, or they've four got pairs. Eight, yeah, yeah, four pairs. They've got four pairs of legs, so eight total little chubby legs. They look kind of like gummy bears. They do, and they move around basically like we used to think they were super rare, but they're all over the place, and they are just grazing on stuff, just grazing on. You know, when you walk through the forest, you're surrounded by them. This fossil has something similar but new. This is research by George Poinar. And Diane Nelson in Invertebrate Biology. The article we're linked to is also by George Dvorsky, also in Gizmodo. So 
in this little chunk of 30 million year old amber dominican from, amber from the hey. dominican republic <laughs> there are some previous to this completely unknown creatures and i say it that way because we don't know what these are outside of being little creatures so this is from the oligocene epoch and these little things like i said there are hundreds in the amber so they got a really good look at them so these things resemble tardigrades very closely. They have eight legs like them. They're pudgy and small, but they're not quite right. They have mandibles, Ugh. which tardigrades do not have. Tardigrades have stylet mouth parts, which mean little piercing mouth parts that they graze on stuff with. Right, right. Like a, a lot of hemipteran bugs have yeah. like pierced plants and then they and, and suck stuff up. And these little guys don't have claws, which tardigrades do have. Okay. So it's got mandibles and no claws. So it's not a water bear. But it's something close. So they dubbed them mold pigs. <laughs> 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 in, otter, in, in honor, as the article says, of its portly and porcine appearance. I love it. And its diet of fungi. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So these are truffling little in <laughs> invertebrates. <laughs> And these are very small. Like you said, we're in micrometers, 100 micrometers long, which is about as big as the smallest of tardigrades. So we're, it's, it's very small, but it is tardigrade sized. It seems like it preferred warm and moist environments where it fed on the fungi as well as other small inverts. So it was not a picky eater from what they could tell. And they were actually able to get a lot of information about them because of how many they had, uh, lots of behavioral stuff, including not only their anatomy, but reproductive behavior and growth. They can actually see that they shed their skin to grow. Ooh. Yeah. So interesting little creatures that they not only named a new species, not only named a new genus, but a new family. That's pretty cool. That's, that's a big deal. So this is now in the family Silomorphidae. And it is Silomorpha dominicana. Wow, a whole new family of life. Yes. Like, that's why at the beginning, new weird creatures. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, something effectively brand new. This is what a lot of times when people ask if we found a new species, I think that this is where their brain is. Is like, we found something and we're like, we don't know what this thing is. Right. But usually it's like, well, no, it's yeah. a rhino. It, it's a part of this specific group of sauropods in this particular lineage on this continent, this is a family. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that they will have to hopefully find more of to maybe narrow down exactly who it's related to. And what an incredible, we've talked about this before, those lucky invertebrate folks, a piece of amber. Yep. With hundreds, like enough to characterize life cycles and stuff. <laughs> What a lucky find. Yeah, and that's not even everything that was in the amber. They also found pseudoscorpions and nematode worms, the fungi, as well as protozoans, all inside this amber chunk. That's so cool. It's ridiculous. So yeah, cool, neat stuff. And I believe that wraps up our news. Oh, goody. So at this point, we're going to take a small breather so that we can dive down and join the plesiosaurs and talk about these weird marine reptiles. Can't wait. So as far as iconic fossil animals go, especially from the Mesozoic, plesiosaurs are pretty high up on the list. Like if I asked for a, a, a landscape spread that included the ocean, from the Mesozoic, it's highly likely one of them would be featured. Right. Your, your choice is ichthyosaurs. Yes. Which are shark-shaped. Yep. Mosasaurs, which are episode 51. Mm-hmm. Or plesiosaurs. And plesiosaurs, even though they are so iconic, there's a lot about them that is often either misrepresented, because the famous form with the long neck is what everyone thinks of, but that's not all there was. But there's also a lot about them we don't know. So, let's start to get to know them a bit. Plesiosauria 
is the actual group we're going to be looking into. Plesiosaur means almost or near to lizards. Because when they were discovered back in the 1820s, they were thought to be closer to normal reptiles, lizards-like reptiles, than the already discovered ichthyosaurs. So, nearer to lizards. So it's kind of, it's a weird name for them now. But back then, that was the mentality. Famously, one of the most complete early specimens, I think it was the second of plesiosaurus ever found, uh, was found by Mary Anning. Yeah. 1823. We know that now, the people of that time did not hear about her <laughs> additions to that study as much as they probably should have. Nope. But she did, she did not discover the very first one. It had already been described, but she discovered one of the most complete, which gave us a lot more information about its anatomy. And man, did plesiosaurs freak people out back then. Because <laughs> they are super weird. Uh, there was one quote in one of the, the uh, websites I looked at that says to a still unidentified paleontologist, so they did not have the source of this, so maybe this is not legit, but the quote was saying that Someone, when they were first describing plesiosaurs, described it as a snake threaded through the shell of a turtle. That's kind of how I've always yeah. <laughs> described them. Yeah. Because their bodies are very sea turtle-like. They're very sea turtle. They're, they're, they're sort of broad and wide and kind of flat mm -hmm. with the four paddles. And the long-necked ones had this long neck sticking out. Which is weirdly snake-looking. Like, the face is very snake-like. And... People did not quite know what to do with them. And so we misunderstood these animals for a long time. <laughs> They're kind of like the ocean version of a lot of dinosaurs in that mosasaurs are lizards. Ichthyosaurs are shaped like sharks. Mm -hmm. There's stuff to compare them to. Yeah. Right? Plesiosaurs are so weird. We have no modern analog. No. For these weirdos. Sorry, Scotland. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No modern, <laughs> nothing living... That is shaped like these creatures. Episode 46. <laughs> but they were hugely successful. So these were dominant throughout the majority of the Mesozoic in the oceans. From the latest Triassic right up to the very end of the Cretaceous. And so we're talking a span of uh, over 135 million years that these were just owning most of the ocean. They witnessed the decline of the ichthyosaurs <laughs> and the rise of the mosasaurs. Yes. Actually, the entire lifespan of the mosasaurs. Yeah, like, <laughs> hugely uh, successful. They also were not just marine. They were all, they, there are specimens found in freshwater habitats. Cool. And they are global. They're found everywhere, even on Australia. <laughs> like, <laughs> everywhere. So, this group was doing extremely well. We just you know, have lots of questions because they're so super weird. So let's go over what makes them so weird and so notable. Like, what is a plesiosaur? So the first feature is that squat body that David was mentioning. That is pretty across the board for plesiosaurs. They had this very stout, very stiff, you know, almost turtle-like. It's not a shell, but it ribs that go all the way around and rigid, you know, which we see in a lot of ocean life that doesn't want to wiggle as they are pushing through the water. They have a short, stubby tail that may have been finned, but this is very debated because there's only some evidence for this and not all of it's agreed upon and one of it has been lost to time. Oh no. So back in 1895, uh, Wilhelm Dames reported a specimen that had what looked like soft tissue imprints around part of the flippers, but also around the tail. Ooh. And around the tail, there was what looked like a diamond stain in the rock. Like a bat tail? Like a little, <laughs> like a, actually like a cartoon dragon little tail almost. Oh, like a like, full... Like a little diamond oh. around the tip of the tail. Like a demon tail. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like it had this little, very small, would have only been maybe a rudder, uh -huh. fin. For whatever reason, that specimen was painted over. Oh, no. <laughs> and they don't want to strip the paint for fear of damaging the chemical remains. Oh. So no one else has gotten to describe that potential soft tissue. So it's basically Wilhelm's word... 
against no other specimen ever having found the same impression. I wonder if some of our newfangled techniques yeah. like fluorescent imaging and such could get through that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no clue. There are a couple of uh, instances where bones have seemed to suggest the presence of a tail fin where the spines on the vertebrae are more compressed or more pronounced and suggest that there might be a fin there, similar to what we see in marine crocs and mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs. But once again, no one has said, oh yeah, obviously. Yeah. It's debated. So you'll see artistic reconstructions with a little round, you know, smooth tail, and then sometimes with a little itty-bitty finned tail. It's so weird for a secondarily aquatic, so descended from land-dwelling ancestors, vertebrate to have a short tail. Mm-hmm. Like, whales and dolphins, episode 41. Mosasaurs, episode 51. Ichthyosaurs all have long tails. Like yeah. Sharks and most fish yeah. tend to have long tails. Pinnipeds are kind of like that. Walruses, seals, and sea lions. Where they're actually flapping their feet back and forth. It They've right. moved them to where the tail would be. Right, they're, they're replacing the tail with the feet. Yeah, and they can't even use their back feet to walk anymore. Like a sea lion can still bring those up underneath and flop around like a sea dog. But seals, those are just, the back feet are useless once they're on land. So it's so weird for a creature to just apparently not have a majorly functional tail or tail equivalent. Yeah, it's, it's notable about them. And the reason they seem to not have a tail is because of what's attached to that stout body, which are four nearly, at least in most plesiosaurs, identical flipper limbs oh. so their limbs are like if you've seen the front arms of a sea turtle those paddle like limbs but they have four that are shaped the same so while sea turtles have two little back fit uh back flippers for their back feet and big flippers for their front arms plesiosaurs have four big ones interesting yes how they use those has been a huge question because no animal today that swims has anything remotely shaped like that with nothing else, you know, to push them. Right, right. Like whales have huge front flippers, but then they're using their tail in the back. Yeah, they've completely gotten rid of the back limbs. And even a lot of, fi like sharks mm -hmm. will have their pectoral fins up front and then, you know, smaller fins down yeah. the way, you know, anal fins and, and, and fins down the way. But... Yeah, no, even sea turtles, like you said, have little back They're flippers. flapping with the front, steering with the back. Yeah. Which has been suggested here. So there have been multiple techniques to try to figure out how they were swimming. The most fun, I believe we actually mentioned in the news. I think so. Is they made a robo plesiosaur. Yeah. <laughs> they 3D printed some fins, put it on some motors that can slide it in the water up and down like it's flapping and then rotate it to put different angles. And basically they just kept messing with it until they found the most optimum energy efficient stroke. And they put dye in the water to see how the water was moving around each flipper. And basically the main questions were, are they flapping in unison? Are they flapping only a pair? You know, as the front flapping and the back are steering like sea turtles, they just have really back, big steering flippers for some reason. Are they flapping out of sync with each other or something else? Are they rowing? Are they, you know, what, what are you doing when you only have flippers for steering and propulsion? And what the robot told them is that it's more of like, they are alternating their flaps, but it's basically the back one follows the front. Okay, like and an undulation. Like an undulation almost, with only two points, you know. And the reason for that is that as the front one makes a wake, every stroke it makes two little wakes, and the back one threads between those wakes oh. and uses the wake of the front to create its next wake and avoids the turbulence by I, flapping that way. I wonder if competitive rowers... Oh, yeah. That's do something similar. I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know. I can tell you something does it similar. The only other animal that they said uses this technique 
are dragonflies. Oh, uh, dude, when you, were, <laughs> when you were talking about flapping and stuff, I wanted to make a dragonfly comparison. I was like, nah, that's totally different. Tell me about dragonflies. So dragonflies have four wings, and they use a very similar flapping pattern where they work through the wakes, the turbulence of the wing in front. So they're underwater dragonflies, just real big. <laughs> Listen, I love my mosasaurs, <laughs> but plesiosaurs just got so much cooler. <laughs> <laughs> sea dragonflies. Yeah. <laughs> the next part of their features is where I have to do a little bit of terminology because that's all pretty standard for all of Plesiosauria. The whole diversity. But once you get past the body to the face, it gets real weird. <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of variability in the shape, size, and length of the head and neck. And this is how they used to be categorized. So plesiosauria used to be split into two groups. The plesiosauridae, which are the long-necked, small head plesiosaurs that have the typical look of elasmosaurus and plesiosaurus. Though the ones that you usually see in pictures. Right, the long necks of the sea. And then the pliosauridae were all the ones with Big heads and short necks. Lyopleurodon style. Chronosaurus. The yep. big, almost croc looking, but with those weird flippers. Right, right. Very like a mosasaur. They, Very... they, they always, when I was a kid, I always used to confuse them where you have, they, their heads are very Mosasaur-like. They're, yeah, another very whale-esque reptile. Yes. Big, big yep. head, big predator. But big arms instead of tiny arms. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but nowadays... Studies have shown that those two body shapes have evolved multiple times on both sides from various groups with short neck, big heads evolving from long neck, little heads and vice versa. Oh, so very plastic, very varied, not distinct groups, definitely <laughs> not monophyletic. So they're more morphotypes than actual groups. Like croc snouts. Yes, exactly. Like some crocs have long, narrow snouts, other crocs have broad snouts, but they're not. That's come and gone in different groups Absolutely. multiple like, times. There's nothing that would stop an alligator from getting a skinny gharial snout if it wanted to. Right. Or I guess if natural selection demanded it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If, if <laughs> pressures pushed it that way, there's nothing about and inherently about an alligator that would stop it from evolving a skinny snout, except for what it's needing to survive that's what happens with these so that's why for my terminology in this episode plesiosaur is going to refer to the group right plesiosaur morphs are going to be long necked little head pliosaur morphs big head little neck right and each time you use that phrase we will remind you dear listeners yes. of what it means but that's i'm going to try to keep the terminology that way so that i'm not saying the plesiosaur-shaped plesiosaurs yeah. and the plesiosaur-shaped plesiosaurs. <laughs> I, I think I ran into that issue in the ankylosaur episode. Yeah. Because the ankylosauria is the whole group, but the ankylosaurids are the ones with the tail clubs. So, yeah, it can get confusing. Well, it's it's plesiosaurus was the first one named, and then everything was named there back from them. But a huge portion isn't even shaped like that. So right. Well, it's, it's the same reason that Tyrannosaurus is a... Tyrannosauroid, Tyrannosaurid, Tyrannosaurid. Yes, yes, exactly. Tyrannosaur. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we we like to reemphasize, <laughs> just in case anyone forgot, this is the group that has Tyrannosaurus. But these are not the only shapes plesiosaurs come in. There are some with mid-length size, uh, mid-length necks and sized skulls. So longer than a pliosaur, shorter than plesiosaur morph, bigger head than you know, a plesiosaur morph, but smaller head than your big pliosaur morphs. So in between. Which makes perfect sense if they're repeatedly transitioning. Yes. And these are interpreted as being fast uh, pursuit predators, potentially very dolphin-like, and may have replaced the ichthyosaurs. There seems to be an abundance of them after the ichthyosaurs go extinct. And now there needs to be new slender-snouted, fast-swimming predators to take down those small prey. That's fascinating because it's also been suggested that mosasaurs took over yeah. for ichthyosaurs. 
We'll talk about the Mosasaur <laughs> connection because oh, they, they've been partially brain, blamed for why we stopped seeing so many of the big Pliosaur morphs <gasps> toward the end. I like hearing is this. Is that they actually replaced them. <laughs> Mosasaurs reign supreme at the end of this episode. <laughs> so let's go over a quick history of the group. How did these come to be? So to start things off, we have to go all the way back to the Triassic. So the Triassic, the first age of the Mesozoic, the age of reptiles. Yes, the first period. period. The Triassic period. Yes. First of three. During this time, we see the rise of a marine group of reptiles called the Sauropterygians. Now, this included a variety of secondarily aquatic reptiles. Some of these, some of the more notable ones, were things like the Pachypleurosaurs, which were these little lizard-like. They looked very lizard-like. They weren't lizards. But they very lizard-like in shape, but long, small-limbed, long-tailed, looked to be fish eaters from their peggy teeth that ranged usually 20 to 60 centimeters long, so small. Okay. But alongside those were others called the Nothosaurs. Now, these are not the only members, but just to give us a, a, a comparison, the Nothosaurs looked similar, at least superficially. They were very lizard-like in shape. They have long necks, long bodies, sharp teeth for grabbing fish, but they seem to have used their limbs to swim much more, while the Pachypleurosaurs seem to use their tails much more. Okay. This becomes important from what you were pointing out, that many aquatic animals seem to use their tail, not many seem to focus on the limbs as much. Nothosaurs seem to be going a route where they were using their limbs to swim much more. This is, uh, there's actually a, a fossil evidence of them pushing themselves along the sea floor. Oh, cool. Trace evidences of them using their hands that way. So a lot of marine animals, it may be weird to say that they're using their tails to swim, but like if you picture a shark, the tail is doing most of the propulsion work. Yes. The fins are there for steering. Yeah, all the fins are there is to make sure they're going the right direction. And whales are very similar. Mm -hmm. You're you're maneuvering. You're you're spinning and steering and turning with your flip flippers up front, but propulsion is in the back. Yes, we surprisingly enough do not swim with our tails. We swim with our limbs. So that's what I mean by propelling themselves with their limbs. It's the way you swim, right? Like a turtle. Yes, where you're moving your limbs to push yourself through the water. Nothosaurs seem to have been doing that. It's also supported in their uh, skeletal structure. These actually got quite big. The biggest ones got to be like five meters long. Wow. So these were notable. And were likely, during the Triassic, some of the largest predators. There's another group of Sauropterygians that may be related. Both Nothosaurs and this next group have been suggested as ancestral. And I've seen even things that suggested that Nothosaurs were ancestral to the next group, which was ancestral to Plesiosaurs. Right, right. This, this is all that sort of early yeah. plesiosaur ancestry. These are either close to or directly or almost directly linked to plesiosaurs. The next one are called the pistosaurs, which look almost identical. Long necks, paddle finned. Nothosaurs had an obvious feet, even though they were very likely webbed. It's very much seems like they could probably pull themselves out of water. Pistosaurs look less so, that they were probably almost fully uh, 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 isolated to the water. And they had very plesiosaur-like shapes. Uh, Bobosaurus is one of the notable ones of them uh, that just looks like a fairly short-necked and medium-sized head plesiosaur. But they were very coastal, and so they had not yet taken over the open oceans. And they were medium in size. From everything I, I, I saw of them, they don't seem to have gotten as big as the plesiosaurs will get. And then, at the very end of the Triassic, true plesiosaurs. We had known that they needed to have evolved in the Triassic because of the huge variety of plesiosaurs we find at the beginning of the Jurassic. Right, a bunch of evolution had already happened. So we, we were almost certain they evolved in the Triassic, but there were very few fossils but we do have fossils of some now. The earliest members that we see are not very big. Two meters long, so like six feet long. Eh, nothing. Itty bitty. Uh, they actually seem to be more 
back when they were categorizing things by the Playa Sorde, more along that lineage. So big head, short necks. Bigger head, shorter neck, but not giant croc head yet. But small, this was the some of the early specimens were found in clay in Germany. And the important thing about them showing up right at the end of the Triassic is that at the end of the Triassic, all the Sauropterygians die out. Episode 15. Except the plesiosaurs, uh, which eke through that extinction. So much the same way that the Triassic period, episode 15, showed this big diversity of archosaurs. Mm -hmm. Early dinosaur cousins and crocs and stuff. And then after the end Triassic extinction, the dinosaurs are the ones that took over. In the water, you had all these different sauropterygians, which... By the way, not to be confused with sarcopterygians, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is the group of fish that eventually gave rise to tetrapods. Totally different. It's always confused me. Yeah. I'm sure there's someone out there going, what? I thought that Tiktaalik was it. No, yeah. it's sauropterygians, soar like lizard, sarcopterygians, sark like, I don't know. <laughs> so. Sarcasm. So, <laughs> I like, like that statement. <laughs> Almost all went extinct in the end Triassic, but the plesiosaurs prevailed they were the only surviving group of sauropterygians and they survived through the extinction at the end triassic beginning of the jurassic and then diversified like crazy why did they survive is a really good question and there are two key things that may have played a big role that seems to be true of them and at least not fully true or maybe not true for the rest of the sauropterygians first is as i mentioned the pistosaurs and nothosaurs, who were, even if fully aquatic and semi-aquatic, were mostly coastal. They were not taking over the oceans. Plesiosaurs were already fully mobile in the open water. They were open water animals by the Triassic. So they had access to the oceans, which may have been what allowed them to survive than the more specialized habitats of the other sauropterygians. The other is that it appears at least some plesiosaurs gave live birth. Oh, hey, this is a thing we see show up in aquatic vertebrates over and over. Absolutely. Polycotylus, a specimen of polycotylus, which is a plesiosaur found in Kansas, preserved an adult female at almost five meters long, so decent size, that had a preserved fetus inside, no evidence that it was eaten because it didn't seem to have acid damage. And the interesting thing about it is that it was a single large fetus, not oh. a clutch, not a, a, a brood. A litter. A litter. <laughs> Which is different than the other marine reptiles that survive throughout the Mesozoic. Those give birth to litters. Plesiosaurs, if, they, if this is indicative of the group only had one large young and when from what they can tell from this specimen based on the development stage if it were to be born at full term it probably would have been about a meter and a half long wow so that's like an elephant yes like one big baby instead of you know puppies you know a whole bunch of puppies yep, which you can lose a few of yeah one big baby like elephants usually indicates parental care Ah. and often is associated with group animals, social, if not hypersocial, at least group... Uh, uh, tolerant. Gregarious, yes, yeah, group yeah, yeah. tolerant, which could mean that plesiosaurs moved in pods of yeah. sorts, or at least there is evidence that the young might have done that in the shallows where... Their fossils are found from time to time. Interesting. Listeners, uh, send us your suggestions for what to call a group of plesiosaurs. Oh, yes. Yeah, a plunder. <laughs> That's my vote. I like that. Yeah. I like a plunder. <laughs> One really cool thing about how fully aquatic plesiosaurs had gotten and how it's notable from other sauropterygians is there was a study that looked at their inner ears, which I think we also mentioned in the news. Interesting. Maybe. Uh, I Go feel on. like we did, where they looked at the inner ears of various marine reptiles, uh, ancient marine reptiles, and they found that they closely resemble modern marine animals in that the near shore specimens, similar to nothosaurs, the more uh, uh, crocodilian shaped individuals, 
have inner ears like a crocodilian. Oh. Inner ears are important because they are your sense, your sense of balance, which in the water where you're moving in 360 degrees is important. The fully aquatic plesiosaur morphs, the long necks, had ears more similar to turtles, which are, as they called them, uh, as they said, flew through the water. The ones right. that are gliding through had very turtle-like inner ears, sea turtle inner ears. The pliosaur morphs had inner ears like whales, oh. who also have big heads and short necks. Huh. Which they think the short neck is the key because their inner ears are especially tiny compared to the others. So these were as ocean-going as our big ocean-going animals today. Cool. So as we move through the Jurassic into the Cretaceous, plesiosaurs are basically just doing great. Uh, they're diversifying, they are globally occupying the oceans and waterways, but we also see a trend in their size. They get bigger. Not all of them, but in general, at the beginning, they are relatively small, and then they get huge. For instance, some of the early specimens for one of the plesiosaur morphs, like Thalassiodracon, was only like six feet long, and is one of the earliest known plesiosaur morphs. Long neck, small head, six feet long. As long as me. Itty bitty. It'd be adorable. You could put it in a pool. <laughs> uh, the pliosaur morphs, one of their earliest members, Romelosaurus, was just a mere 20 feet long. Oh, just just, tiny, just a little boy. Just, ooh, he's so cute. Uh, both of those are from the early Jurassic. <laughs> By the time we get to the Cretaceous, you have plesiosaur morphs that are upwards of 50 feet long. <sighs> and... <laughs> Pliosaur morphs that are over 40. Wow. Huge, multi-ton. For the pliosaur morphs, we're talking in the neighborhood of 25 tons. Wow. Massive animals. Which is interesting because they are maxing out around the same size that the biggest mosasaurs maxed mm -hmm. out. And that, for the most part, the biggest ichthyosaurs maxed out. Yeah. They're getting to those upper marine reptile sizes. And we're just dominating... The ecosystems up until they weren't <laughs> 66 million years ago when the in Cretaceous extinction happened in episode five and they and all the other big marine reptiles or at least predatory reptiles died out yeah no more mosasaurs no more plesiosaurs ichthyosaurs were already yeah gone. they were they were long gone so that's the overview of their history now let's take a little closer look at the two morphotypes. Starting next, we'll look at the pliosaur morphs in just a moment. So to start off, we're going to look at the big-headed, short-necked pliosaur morphs. We're going to start with them because... I want to save our long-necked individuals for last because those long necks are a whole topic on their own. So let's start with the slightly more straightforward. <laughs> start with the ones that are kind of whale noses. Yeah, sort of shapes. that are like big whale crocs. Yeah. Like, Ooh. these things are, they're obviously big apex predators. There's nothing about them that doesn't scream apex predator. These skulls can be over six feet long. For the biggest individuals, I saw a couple of things that said they can almost reach 10 feet. So wow. massive, massive. These are things with heads longer than your bed that, if you're listening to us while you're in bed, is in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking. Be, you could be in its mouth right now. Yes, you wouldn't even know. Massive jaws, big teeth. These were definitely some of the biggest predators in the oceans during the Mesozoic. Now, the name Pliosaur is interesting because I saw one source that said it meant Pliocene lizards, which is like, which is huh. weird because they're not anywhere near the Pliocene. But then every other source I looked at said that that's not at all what it means. <laughs> that it actually means Plio means more, more lizard. Yeah. Pliocene, I'm pretty sure I don't have it in front of me, but it's more recent. Yes. Yeah. So... In case anyone comes across that meaning, that that site is... Ignore that part. Wrong. 
More Lizard was named by Richard Owen in 1841. I've heard of him. Because, much like the plesiosaurs, uh, the plesiosaur name before it, they thought this was closer to Crocs and <laughs> everything. So, almost lizards, more lizards. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Sauropterygians, so this whole group that includes all these critters, are, you know, their own major branch of yes. the reptile family tree, but they are nearby the Lepidosaurs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are your lizard snakes and tuataras. Yes, and when I was looking at the... I, I, I was tempted to put a section into, like, let's talk a little bit about where Sauropterygia falls on the tree, and one of the areas that it falls into, depending on the phylogenetic tree you look at, is the uh, Pantestodines, so the... the turtles the turtles lineage which means it was all over the place and this is a plesiosaur episode so <laughs> <laughs> so so either they are a not super close but still kind of close cousin of lizards and snakes mm -hmm. or they are a distant cousin of turtles yep. in which case who knows where yep. they belong i saw some things that were like they're almost surely somewhere in archosauria or close cousin to it and then I saw others that <laughs> didn't have that anywhere on the tree that I was like, so Sauropterygia Who's to say? <laughs> is why we started there. <laughs> here's, here's the reptile family tree and here's Sauropterygia. Yes. Now, just to go over a couple of the examples of these pliosauromorphs, we'll start with Pliosaurus. Okay. The original, the one named for the group. The or eponymous. The, the eponymous. The hippopotamus. I know that joke gets made every time the word eponymous gets used. Uh, not when I say it. <laughs> <laughs> but I always, uh, I always find it funny. Pliosaurus was a Jurassic uh, specimen, one of the largest, actually, which is you know one of those cases where the the first example is one of the more impressive. These could be thirty to forty feet long, so ten to thirteen meters. And we're absolutely carnivorous because stomach contents have been collected from at least a couple specimens. Cool. One specimen, uh, this was research uh, by Michael A. Taylor, where they found remains of an armored dinosaur. So the group that includes ankylosaurs and stegosaurs. Yeah. Some member of that group left two scoots and another piece of bone that is associated with but can't be confirmed as from the same individual, but it's definitely dinosaur. We're associated with a skeleton of one of the Pliosaurus. It can't be confirmed that it is stomach content because of the disruption of the bones and some of the degradation, but it is potential evidence that this likely scavenged on a drowned dinosaur, not likely pulling it into the water. Right, right, right. But that it was eaten bits of it. And there are bite marks from uh, uh, these big predators on other fossils. So we know they were hunting, but they may have even been eating dinosaur bodies. <laughs> Two of the most famous, though, that most people will hear about, that we've already thrown the names out, is Leoplorodon and Kronosaurus. And those are two of the big names and two of the largest of the, the, the species that have this body shape. Uh, there were plenty of smaller biosauromorphs, things like... Cryonestes was only like 10 feet long. So there were a few that were very small comparatively, but a lot of them got huge. Uh, Leoplorida and Kronosaurus both are in that 30, that over 30 foot size range. I want to emphasize that for Leoplorida because <laughs> even if you did learn about it from walking with dinosaurs, they really overestimated the size. Yeah, don't they say that it's like 80 feet 80 long? 80 feet long. Yeah. Uh, which it, which it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's very much not. The reason they that the size got so messed up is if you use the skull size and scale it to what would be a normal body, it would be 80 feet long. But pliosauromorphs have ridiculously big heads okay like when you see some of the reconstructions like the artist drawings and skeletons that are fully put together it's like a body and a and a head seesaw <laughs> where it's like almost the midpoint is the neck it's if you were using normal sized faces this is a monster the size <laughs> of almost a blue whale 
<laughs> but if you're using the other weirdos that it's <laughs> related to, it's 30 to 40 feet. Still massive. Like, this is a big, big predator. And we know that at least Chronosaurus fed on other plesiosaurs because there are bite marks preserved on the skull of an Australian plesiosaur, Eromangosaurus, which the report said it actually can't be affirmed whether it survived the attack or not. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it might wow. have gotten bit in the face and then swam away. <laughs> so they were hunting each other. Like, plesiosaurs yeah. were absolutely feeding on one another, very much like sharks. These were big, scary predators with a notable bite. Uh, a very interesting bite, actually. So massive skulls. I've emphasized that over and over again, but I, I really can't. That is kind of the feature of them. Giant skulls. The tyrannosaurs of the ocean. Just these huge things that, according to a study by David Fofa et al., could produce some really impressive bites. Uh, they digitally modeled the skulls to try to figure out what kind of bite they could produce as well as uh, reconstructing what the muscle, what the musculature would have been like. And the musculature indicated big bite. Interestingly enough, the skull is fairly flexible, especially in the snout area. So it, it doesn't seem like they had a rigid skull like T-Rex hmm. to produce these big bites. And what they think it is, is that this is a balancing act where a fairly, you know, comparatively weak but not rigid skull that was put together with muscles that could produce high bite forces allowed for a trade-off between agility, strength, and hydrodynamics so that they were having the best of all the worlds or a little bit of them all. So they definitely were not just underwater T-Rex. And it means that most of their bite strength probably came behind those joints, not at the snout tip. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they get you in the back of the mouth. So they mm -hmm. grab you with the front and then get you in the back and start chopping yeah, down. Yeah, absolutely. And that's you see that with uh, crocs do that a bunch, where they will grab something and then literally throw it back there and just crunch on it. Yeah. The bite forces are impressive. They used modern crocs uh, as a comparison to kind of help scale their bite force estimates. They definitely found some outliers where, like, in one of them, the saltwater croc was almost equivalent with a 40 foot long, you know, so a, a 20 foot versus a 40 foot animal were making comparable bite forces. Hmm. So they're saying either the bite force for the croc is, was just representing peak and theirs was more average, or they were representing the initial bite, not a continued bite. Or crocs just produce really strong. Bite. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's an unfair comparison. Yeah. But for the most part, they were fairly in line with one another. And what they found is that certain individuals, like Pliosaurus and Chronosaurus, could have made bites that produced somewhere between six and 7,000 pounds of force. And the max estimate they had for Pliosaurus was 10,000 pounds. Wow. So huge bites. Not much these things couldn't take down in the water. But they also seem to have very sensitive snouts. Uh, one study, also by David Flofa, at all, saw in a very well-preserved six-foot skull that they CT scanned all of these little channels in the skull that seem to be very similar to other skulls that have nerve endings running to the outside of the skull, which could suggest that it was a very sensitive, very highly uh, uh, receptive snout. Now, the fun thing that they point out is it's unclear what sensory system this would be supporting. Hmm. Because in the water, there's two that you could really point to right away, which is something like a crock face yep. that's little pressure sensors. But we don't know that they didn't have electrosense or something like that. You know, something unusual in modern reptiles. But it could just be blood vessels channeling to supply the skin in that area. So it's not guaranteed that they had some super high sensory system, but it definitely seems like something interesting was going around with that long snout. Right. They're sounding a lot like crocs. Yeah. And it, you have sensitive snouts, high bite force, big faces. And that made them dominant predators in the ocean until toward the end of the Cretaceous. 
most of the dates I looked up did not have pliosaur morph species to 66. It was usually around 90 or 80 million years ago, which is shortly after mosasaurs show up. It's around the same time that the ichthyosaurs disappeared. Yeah. A lot of sources I looked at suggested that that is connected. I didn't see any official, definitely there's a correlation, but a lot of people seem to have the hunch that mosasaurs may have pushed these big pliosaur morph predators out of their top predator spot. Which makes sense because, you know, that's a similar morphology, right? Big heads, strong jaws, dominant aquatic Mm -hmm. predators. Yeah, I could definitely see. Easy to imagine competition between them. But the rest of the plesiosauria does make it to the end of the Cretaceous. Okay. Just most of those had longer necks. So the plesiosauromorphs, the long neck, little headed plesiosaurs, these are what most things just call plesiosaurs. <laughs> like, yes. I've also seen some that call them the elasmosaur morphs. Yeah, I've seen that. I've heard them called elasmosaurs. Yes, the elasmosaurs and the pliosaurs. It's it, the terminology is all over the place, partially because these are not distinct groups. You right. know, if you were to use the actual group names, you'd be like, oh yeah, the cryptoclidids. What the what's? <laughs> you mean plesiosaurs? Right. Yeah. You know, and so there's not a clean terminology for the groupings. These are very, very famous. As I said at the beginning of the episode, they were some of the earliest of the marine reptile fossils we found. They also feature, because they were some of the early famous ones, they also feature prominently in a lot of early schlocky dinosaur movies. Yeah, they do. So like one mil, I think one million BC has a Is where it's like flipping the raft. Comes up on the the beach and it's snaky neck Mm -hmm. is attacking people. Yeah. Yeah, it's, they've, they've. Uh, become very iconic, not always in the best way. <laughs> Some of them are really fun. There's an Attenborough sur- Saurus. Yeah, there is. Which is one of these. Uh, this is a 16-foot long one. You know, so just a couple thousand pounds. This one's fairly small. Yeah, no big deal. But then you get into the Cryptoclitus, and this is a whole group, Cryptoclitus being the more fa- the most often referenced one. Eponymous. Which get up to be 25 feet long and up to 8 tons. Some of these members you'll often see, as David mentioned with 1 million BC, suggestions of maybe a semi-aquatic or that they could pull themselves on land. Right, like sea turtles. Yeah. Cryptocolitis has evidently been suggested that because it has a more, as some things called it, a seal-like proportions, that it may be able to pull itself up. But I don't see that very commonly, and most things seem to agree that no, probably not. Yeah, it seems like it was one of those early popular Mm -hmm. ideas, but more recently, I've never heard anyone seriously arguing. You'll see it pop up every... If you go look up plesiosaurs after listening to us here, you'll still see it suggested here and there. Yeah. But it's usually not backed by research, and it's not the common idea. Especially when you get into things like the Mauisauruses and the Elasmosaurids, which are huge. These are 50 foot long, you know, over 10 tons. These are massive, massive animals. Mauisaurus was one of the biggest plesiosaurs at toward the end of the Cretaceous that's ever been found, uh, especially by weight. This was a truly big, you know, whale-esque plesiosaur morph. But the elasmosaurs are by far the most famous other than plesiosaurus, even though a lot of times when people are talking about plesiosaurus, they're often pointing to an elasmosaur. I saw that a number of times when I was looking for pictures. They're like, yeah, a plesiosaurus. I'm like, no, that's definitely not because that neck's <laughs> huge. Elasmosaurus, which include elasmosaurus, have some of the most notably long necks of this whole morphotype. These individuals are often seen with measurements like having a 34 foot long body. 22 feet of that (laughs) being neck. Wow. (laughs) So the neck alone is seven meters long. Alberonectes, another elasmosaur, has an equally ridiculous neck, just slightly longer, like 23 versus 22, but has over 70 vertebra in that neck. 
Wow. I saw a couple of references that said 72 to 76. But Who, who's m- counting? More than any other vertebrate. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> this is a ridiculous neck. Which brings us to the really big question. Why the long necks? Yeah. Like... Yeah, there's an article that made the same joke. Oh, I made that in my sure. notes, and then I found that when I Googled it. But why? Why in the world? What are you doing? What are you doing with these long necks? These long necks are so ridiculous that the first time Elasmosaurus was put back together by Cope, hey, which we mentioned. You know that guy. Yep. In our Bone Wars episode. 58. Edward Cope put the head on the tail, so it was a short neck and a long tail. Which, from... You know, the, the the standing across the room makes a lot more sense. Absolutely. Like, how many animals have tiny tails and super long necks? And not only does that make sense just as far as animals go, it also makes sense hydrodynamically. That's right. way more hydrodynamic <laughs> than having this long pole sticking out in front of you that you're going to push through the water. So even though Cope was, you know, a pu- publicly humiliated. Yeah, embarrassingly wrong. At the face of it, and especially because these animals were still fairly new, this was only 1868, you know, so we weren't even 50 years since we've known about these weirdos. It was still not a common idea that these long neck things were swimming around. So what were they doing with these necks? The earliest interpretations showed what the movies like to show, where they have these long swan-like necks that they're reaching around and that they're snapping at stuff with. Right. Super flexible. Very flexible. Some of the around stuff. Oh yeah. Some of the, um, artworks for early plesiosaur reconstructions have like almost a corkscrew thing going where it's just looping and spiraling and almost tied itself in a knot. Yeah. We talked about in, uh, the original King Kong. Yes. In our silver screen science series. Very yeah. serpentine. Yep. Because that's what the suggestion was, is that these were effectively sea turtles with a snake body up front that they could use to snap at fish and strike and, you know, pluck things out of the air like a, you know, with their swan-like necks. But none of the evidence supports that. In fact, it seems that they had extremely inflexible necks, that their necks were fairly rigid. Not rimrod, you know, not completely straight, unable to move. But they, they were not tying themselves in knots. They were reinforced. The bones of the neck are very tightly connected. They're not fused, but they are connected with a number of articular surfaces and seem to have had lots of muscle. So don't think skinny snake. Think big trunk of a neck going down supported. The muscle would have made it strong, but it also would have made it pretty inflexible. You know, if you work out uh, a muscle area, <laughs> you start to lose some of the motion there because muscle's in the way. So based on this new information, how much could they use the neck? You know, is, is the first question is what could they do with it? And from the looks of most of the research, they could not lift it up much. Okay. They couldn't bend it up toward the sky, but they could bend it down very well. And so they could arc it toward the sea floor much more than they could lift it up toward the surface. Now, side to side seems to differ depending on the research. Some say not much. Some say decently. One said preferably. So there seems to be some variance there. There are even some with particularly weird necks. Some species of groups like Romelosaurids actually have asymmetrical vertebra, where, as it says, the tops of every other vertebrae in the neck bulges out to the right. What? So they may have had like a side-necked turtle thing going on? Weird. Where they preferred one direction? And it's seen in all the specimens of the same species. Huh. So it's not a weird malfunction. So they they could only turn to the left. <laughs> As their hole is just turned to the left. They aren't ambi-turners. And they, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another group, the Leptoclidids, also show a similar structure. And they're on opposite sides of the phylogeny. So this was evolved separately. Oh. Weirdos. Yeah. They're just weird. So fairly stiff necks could only bend in certain directions, you know, more so than others. Definitely was not doing the swan-like S or snake-like striking poses. So what were they doing with it? Well, the first question is, how in the world were they swimming with it? 
Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> you put a phone pole on your face and then you're going to push it straight through the water, <laughs> which physics wise is obviously a bad idea. That's a whole bunch of surface for drag and it's just not going to work. You're not chasing anybody down that way. Yeah. But they were making it work somehow. So there have been some suggestions. Some of those have shown that the necks worked better at different speeds. That, for instance, at slow speeds, it caused a ridiculous amount of drag and would have been very inefficient. But at higher speeds, it actually works differently. And they were able to draw some parallels between their neck and modern long neck birds that strike it into the water. That the long neck actually can become more hydrodynamic when you're moving at a higher speed. And so this suggests that they may not have been coasting around in areas, but traveling long distance. And this was a, an efficient neck for long distance open ocean high speed, but maybe not, or a relatively high speed. We're not talking like barracuda so much, but, you know, blue whales are very fast, even though they don't look fast moving long distances. There's also some research that shows that the shape of the neck angling down may have acted like a hydrofoil similar to the curve on the wing of a plane and created lift and helped the plesiosaurs move, uh, the elasmosaurs particularly, move without having to push themselves up. So they're generating their own lift so they can devote their flippers to just pushing forward. Yeah. Weird. Which you see in other open ocean animals like uh, oceanic white tip sharks have ridiculously long pectoral fins. The two big ones up front are like plane wings for the same reason. If you're swimming in <laughs> over the abyss, you don't want to constantly be pushing up and wasting your energy. So you just want to glide through the water. Cool. Yeah. So it actually looks like swimming's not too bad. Now it gets really bad as they bend the neck. Like if they start to turn it in any direction while they're swimming, all their efficiency goes away. But at slow speeds, they could have swam with their necks bent more easily. So it's more likely that while they were moving quickly over long distances, the neck was held relatively straight. And at slower speeds, they could be moving the neck around. So you are traveling across the ocean, neck forward, a little bit down, which mm -hmm. I've seen reconstructed and I never yeah, thought that, about. That little arc. The, yeah, it forms a little arc. And then when it's hunting time, maybe you slow down and you're moving your face around looking for food. Mm -hmm. Now that's where we get into the, the interesting solutions for how were they using the necks as predators? Because as far as we can tell, all of plesiosauria were predatory. We haven't found any individuals that seem to indicate herbivory. Uh, we do see some different feeding structures. We talked in the news about the filter feeding yep. plesiosaur that seemed like it had uh, krill eating seal teeth, but most of your elasmosaur shaped plesiosaurs, your, your long necked ones have very sharp peg like teeth typically seen for grabbing fish or soft inverts like uh, squid. How in the world are you using this long neck to aid you as a predator? And there are some solutions. Uh, not all of them make perfect sense for you could do this. I don't know why you'd get a long neck to do that, but you could. But the ones that use the neck that you'll most often see, the one that I at least most often see suggests is that it's for stealthing up to a school of fish or small animals. That if you are this massive 50 foot long animal with this giant body, you don't want to bring the giant body close to the little animals, but your little head, which is only a little bit bigger than those animals, might not be so scary. And that you can stick it out like a carrot on a pole and get it real close in there and then snap one of them. So that's that's the most common suggestion that I often see is that it's some sort of uh, a stealth hunting or or um, a weird form of ambush predation. Right, right. You remain inconspicuous. Because your big fat body's over there <laughs> and your itty bitty head's way over here. It's like the episode of uh, Looney Tunes where the, the buzzard sees a little turtle head sticking out of the wall and then the camera pans out and it's a dragon yes that's behind the mountain <laughs> so that's one of the ones the other one though is that it could have been used to reach into areas that are difficult to get into you know that it could have been sticking it down burrows or sticking into you know caves or into reefs and so that it's picking you know almost anteater style 
going down and getting prey out of places they would normally be safe from such a large predator. But one of the more interesting ones is that it may have just increased their feeding range. Right, right. Which is something I've seen suggested for sauropods as well. Yep. Is that I don't need the long, re- the long neck to reach my food, but now I can stand in one spot and I can feed over 50 feet of grassland by swinging it side to side. They may have done the same thing as sit down on the sandy bottom and then just look for food and then pick up and move on to the next spot as they pick for food while their body sits still. That is the, uh, the way that I actually imagine that is them slowly cruising over the sea floor and sweeping the head. Yeah, like a radar signal. Grabbing, well, just, you know, yeah. sweeping back and forth to grab things. You're using very little energy to mm-hmm. move. Mm-hmm. And your head is sort of out there reaching. I That's the explanation that I've always really liked. Yes. Because the first two you described, I don't really like. The, the... Like, they sound very just so to me. The stealthing one, the only reason the stealthing one holds more water than than it might not for me is because I've heard similar things suggested for how things like colossal squids might hunt with their ridiculously long hooked tentacles Mm -hmm. is that they may use them to just reach into schools of fish and grab. Right, right. Because it doesn't seem like they're using the same, they're not, they're not the fast swimming squids. Right, right. Bulby. Well, and I, I definitely can see that as a handy side effect of yes. having this big. But like you said, what is the selective pressure that drove Why? you to developing this feature? Mm-hmm. I very much like the sauropod style where it's, I plant myself here and I can reach all of these trees without taking a step. And then I walk over here and I can do it again. And I, the only thing I've seen that people have brought up that tends to poke holes into that one is on the more rigid models of the neck, they might not have actually been able to swing it as much to quickly right, right. sweep an area. But I, d- I do really like that. It's kind of, as one source I read called it, uh, predatory grazing. Yes. But a lot of people have also pointed out it could be display structure. That's true. That you could have this long neck partially as a way to show off and that there could have been displays all along down. It could have been colorful... You could have uh, blushed, you know, colors, but that just the size of it could be impressive for uh, the opposite sex. Or these are not flexible, flimsy necks. They could have been fighting with them like giraffes Like do. giraffes. Yeah. <laughs> these big muscular necks could have actually been wielded. Yeah. So they may have had most likely way more than one purpose. Right. For anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, go to YouTube. And oh, we'll Yes. Go- Giraffes fighting? Giraffe necking. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's what it's called. And whole, oh, <laughs> just like swinging bats at each other. Yeah. It's it's when you have a, a bow staff for a neck, <laughs> you can slam it into your rivals. But there are also some other weird questions for like, how did breathing and eating and swallowing work in these long necks? And how did their circulatory system adjust? Because giraffes have very specialized blood vessels to keep the blood from backing up down the neck with how long it is. So lots of weird mysteries with these long neck plesiosaurs. It's interesting that long necks in the fossil record consistently confuse us because we just don't really have animals like that today. Not really. But the giraffe is about as extreme as it gets. And that's still just kind of a stretched out horse. Yeah. And it's, it's, we have all the information for that one. So that one makes sense for us. The other ones are at different angles. Yeah, they're thin. They're really long. They're horizontal. They're not reaching up. Yeah, it's just, it's something that has been very popular in life history, but just today we are lacking it. Yep. It's very, very, very weird. Well, the last thing I want to mention before we wrap our, wrap up our discussion is one of the coolest bits of information I found, which is that there is evidence of skin impressions. Oh, fun. One specimen of Mauriciosaurus, which was a, a short-necked, a fairly short-necked plesiosaur morph, actually left skin impressions which suggested that it had little rectangular or trapezoidal scales. Ooh. Uh, and even seemed to have left the outline of some of the flippers. That's very cool. Yeah, so we even kind of know what their skin might have looked like, at least on this one. <laughs> <laughs> the other interesting thing it showed is that the tail was almost part of the body like and that 
it was this little stubby fat tail. So the body just came into this teardrop shape at the end of the tail. It did not have a distinct little tail sticking off, which is how most artists draw them is with this little stubby blended in tail. Right. Practically no tail at all. Yeah. So they probably weren't using it for much of anything. There's lots of other cool specimens. We're going to put up lots of pictures in the blog post, but that's, that's a pretty good overview of plesiosaurs. We have, we've covered a lot of the ocean critters. Yeah. We've done sharks. We did whales. We did the evolution of whales. Yes. There's more to talk about on all these groups. Oh, absolutely. There always is. We uh, did mosasaurs. Yes, we did. And now plesiosaurs. So there's there's a notable absence in that list. <laughs> Let us know what else you want to hear about. <laughs> absolutely. Listeners. So yeah, well, hope you enjoyed learning about these weirdos. But before we sign off, one last little bit, because we have a patron question. Ooh. Now, mentioned at the beginning, we have a Patreon. You can also ask us questions at certain levels that we'll answer here on the podcast. So our question for today comes from Angie, who said, If you could be bitten by any radioactive prehistoric creature and assume their powers, what animal would you choose? Think Spider-Man. <laughs> Angie would choose Short-Faced Bear or Meganura. So Megan, you are the Griffin flies. The big dragonfly cousins. From the Carboniferous. What a cool question. Yes, I like this question. Oh, man. <laughs> if I could get the powers from a radioactive prehistoric creature, what would it be? Now, if we're thinking Spider-Man, Spider-Man totally cheats because Spider-Man's only, like, really spidery powers are crawling on walls. Yeah. And web slinging, which he invented. Yeah, which he does not do <laughs> biologically. But keeping in the spirit. I I had to think on this one for a little bit. I'm, though, going to have to lean a little more man spider than Spider-Man. Uh, <laughs> for any comic book fans out there, you might you know, know. but you know what we're talking about. There's a moment where he transforms more fully into spider and gets four more arms and fangs and hair all over right. his body. We're talking man bat as opposed to Batman. Yes. That's the way I want to go. I want to, I want to be more Killer Croc, but yeah, yeah. cause, cause I want, I want to look like him, but it's still, if I were bitten by radioactive prehistoric creature, my two choices would either be a, a Caprosuchus or Borosuchus terrestrial crocodile, uh, croc cousin, or a giant sloth would be really cool. Yeah. I was thinking sloth or Therizinosaur. Yeah. Just for the image of having, like, wolverine claws, but yeah. the claws are way too big. Like a lady death strike. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, like, coming out of my wrist. Yes. And it's just these huge claws. Part of me, maybe I'm biased by this episode, but part of me also wants to go Mosasaur. Yeah. And just be, like, really fast in the water. Be Aquaman, Yeah, I was going to say a really aggressive Aquaman. A really angry Aquaman. <laughs> See, sloths, <laughs> the reason I I thought giant sloths is you'd get the claws, yeah. which is cool. You'd get to be beefy, so you get to be like the brawler on the team, the Hulk-esque character. But you'd also get to have osteoderms. And I was going to say, oh. with osteoderms in mind, maybe you go full ankylosaur. Oh, yeah, ankylosaur would be fun. you're just armored with spikes. Oh, you'd be like A-bomb. And then, like, your hand could be a club. Yes. You're, uh, you know, you're offhand. So yeah. So you can still eat food. Mm -hmm. You're just swinging it around. That would ankylosaur. be cool. That, ankylosaur would be really cool. See, I, the terrestrial crocs, which is, you know, is on brand for me. But the reason I was going with them is because then I'd be like a an agile killer croc yeah i'd be fast and i'd have <laughs> snake steak knife teeth and i'd still be armored but i'd be able to like run you down instead of punching through walls you could also go real weird and go with like the weird triassic stuff like drapanosaurs oh yeah and just get the power of all the things they've been hypothesized to do. <laughs> so I'll just have these big beefy arms and I'll be good at climbing trees and digging and fighting. <laughs> as I, I as the best of all worlds. It's like a, it's like a, a, a random, randomized power. It's each day. Yep. It's a different <laughs> hypothesis that yes. powers you. So today we're going with so-and-so at all's 2012 yeah. hypothesis. You just wake up and you're like, what can I do today? <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm climbing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we want to be sort of low-hanging fruit, Dromaeosaurs is a real good choice. Yeah. Just straight-up Deinonychus Velociraptor. Because then you're real agile and you're jumpy. 
and because now you're a dino ninja i yeah you're a dino ninja i'd be fine being covered in feathers oh yeah fine with that i would be beautiful yep. and deadly yep which and and what else could you ask for oh you'd be able to do like I, i'm just visual, visualizing in the comic book of like you know a fan dance scene and then murders people <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's like the, the the scene where you know the performing lady on the stage yeah with the flowy robes or the the sultry dance or yeah. whatever and then knives yep yeah that would be what exactly be like. what i'm saying is i want to be a pretty sultry performer <laughs> with knives yeah that's all i want i, I don't see any downside to this that's awesome <laughs> There's a lot of fun ones. Cool. Well, someday we'll just see what really gets me about it is a lot of the most exciting powers to get from animals today are things that we don't find in the fossil record. That's that. Well, that's uh, that. That was the tricky thing with like Spider-Man. All the things he does that are spidery are things that if you if I just handed you a spider exoskeleton, you would never know it did. Right. So who knows? The random generator is like, yeah, here is an ability that. <laughs> You have no idea what creature had this. Well, see, that's what would happen is they'd, you know, we'd be in the mad scientist lab. He's like, and now I'm going to infuse you with <laughs> Dinosuchus DNA. And then all of a sudden, I was, why can I hear everything? It's yeah. Like, oh, evidently they had ridiculous hearing or something weird. Uh, apparently. <laughs> I have the ability to digest anything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fun question, Angie. In fact, hey, Baskin Coyle. What would you choose? What prehistoric superhero would you would you be? And what would your name be? Oh yes, names. I, I'm we terrible. don't have time to think of names right now. I'm terrible at names, so we'll we'll have to. We should we should come. We should settle on and make two. Yeah, we'll all right. Yeah. We'll 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 pick our favorites and we'll come up. So with that it. we'll share them and and then we want to hear all of yours. Great question, Angie. Thank you for that. And that's gonna wrap up the episode. That's about it. That's it. So as usual. Check out the blog post. Lots of pictures are going to be in the blog post. There's tons of cool examples, so I'm going to try to put a bunch of them there. Let us know if you have questions. Let us know if you want to hear more. Thanks again to Taylin and Jonathan for suggesting the episode. Check in for Spooky. Don't forget, it's about to wrap up at the end of the month. And we release episodes every fortnight. Next episode, episode 73. Yeah. Who knows what that... Oh, actually, I know what that one's going to be about. And I'm so excited. <laughs> I just remembered in this moment what that episode's going to be about. Oh, you're all going to love it. So check in then to see what David's all excited about. I'm all... I'm so excited. I got so <laughs> caught up in this episode, I couldn't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>